Hello and welcome back to Listenable, or if it's your first time here, g'day. Listenable is a podcast where we try and normalise disability through the voices or faces, if you're watching this on YouTube or our socials, of me, Angus O'Loughlin, able-bodied idiot. And I'm Dylan Alcott. Uh, I had someone come up to me on the plane the other day and they were currently mid-binge Listenable. I thought oh, they were God. listening to it. How I, thought, cool I, thought, I thought you meant drinking. I was like, oh, God, what did they say? Well, no, well, they probably were too, because, I mean, to listen to 10 in a row. Um, they were like, mate, love it, just binging it out at the moment. How cool is that? Perfect. When you see a listen able in the wild, mm. as I love to call it, or any, I always get that same feeling with my book. When I get on an airplane, they're like, they're more possible this. And they're reading the book mm. and they're pumped. They're like, that is pretty cool, yeah, actually. So for everyone who's listening, especially the new listeners, please tell your mates about it because we want more and more people to get around this enable. To justify what I'm about to do, I'm going to just give Dylan a plug. His book is called Able. It's available now. Go get yourself a copy. Now, that's we nice. have had a very DM. Rare. Very rare. rare from you. Well, you're about to shoot me down for this. Oh, rare W. We had a DM uh, last week from somebody who wants to start their podcast. Uh, they're based in Melbourne. Uh, where we are and they said uh, I'd love to be working in the studios that you do and I said well did you know that our studio is for hire oh so we have accessible podcast studios it looks and sounds exactly like you're watching right now and uh, yeah I've got a link below I thought there was like a punchline coming so you just pump me up just so you can pump up your own business exactly yeah from your of which I'm not a part of .com.au that is all Angus I'm not a part of this you punk. can do studio hire in accessible oh, so beautiful you... studios in Collingwood Melbourne you said one nice thing about me purely for your own benefit well, think about this. There's other podcast companies out there who do audio only. We are an audio and visual oh, now with no leaning, exception now company. Now leaning on the accessibility features. Of so course. Because oh. you want your audience to not miss out on the conversation. What do you like call that money when it's disability? No, we'll get to that. Oh. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Oh, he's got a crash car that he's very excited about. Uh, we do have a guest uh, in studio with us right now. Uh, and a very funny and long story about how we ended up with this person in front of us. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, hi guys. Nice to see you. My name's Matt Pieri. I'm a Melbourneian living in London at the moment. Uh, I run a tech company called Sociability, um, which we help to sell people find accessible places. Would you call yourself a tech entrepreneur? <laughs> uh, not publicly, but... Uh, it's a funny word. It's really not my shady career, tech entrepreneur. People, Someone called me when I get introduced for keynotes when they write their own one. Mm. I say charity founder, business owner, but they always change it to entrepreneur. And I go... Oh, I don't know. It just makes me feel like a bit Elon Musky. Yeah. What about you? Where do you sit with it? Yeah, I mean, it's not a term I would describe myself as. Uh, I think particularly because for me, it wasn't something I sort of set out to be. Like I wasn't, I didn't go to uni to be an entrepreneur or kind of have plans to be an entrepreneur. Um, for me, it's sort of, it's more, I'm trying to solve a problem and this is the way in which I think I can help make a change in that space. Mm. And so I definitely fell into it. So I don't re readily associate with the term, although I do think it's, uh, yeah, it sort of gets bandied about a lot these days. It is fitting for you though, I must say. And <laughs> you've actually been on this podcast slash studio before, haven't you? I have, but these are much nicer studios than the last time. So, Thank you very yeah. much. And available for hire. Oh, uh, from God. your pocket. Right. Com. Oh. You link below. Come and use the studios now, in Melbourne. Very we had a bit of an incident last time we were in here that... <laughs> we're not here. Not these studios. Yeah. No, these are great. Our old radio network. Somebody in our old team made a bit of a boo-boo mm. and may have not recorded it or it was really bad or your mic wasn't on or something really, really elementary. Well, what the happened? excuse was that it was too glitchy to play and then I said, send me the audio and he said, I've deleted it. And I went, you, <laughs> and I said to him, you didn't hit record, did you? And he said, I did. I definitely did. And I said, well, send me the audio. And <laughs> that audio never made it into my inbox. Not only when you don't press record, and Amelia, make sure if we are, are we recording, recording right here, now? we are recording. We, we don't get Matt for imagine third time. That, I'll, imagine I'll that. Back. You literally have a job um, to concentrate on making sure the recording is right. You're sitting as a producer behind a desk for an hour mm. And there's a big red button <laughs> that sits there glowing when it's recording. And he obviously sat there for an hour on his phone or something like that, not engaged. That's not nothing against yeah. you, Matt. It's more maybe like still in myself. Yeah. Maybe he just didn't like my answers and sort of thought, let's preemptively. Yeah, yeah actually, what happened, when you turned around, Angus went like this. Ooh, yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and just wasted all about off. 45 minutes. Yeah, oh. No, but we're going to consider it a pre-interview. Um, right. We spoke about, this was like 2021, and we spoke about sociability as an app at launch. At the time, thinking back on it, because I don't have evidence of it, I remember <laughs> you saying there was only a few um, places at the time as you were kind of like expanding your network and trying to find businesses to show their accessibility requirements or accessibility options. 
options within their um you know, stores, mm -hmm. cafes, restaurants, bars, offices. And now, I mean, you're living in London, you go to University of Oxford. So I think it is really great because we don't follow up with guests often, um, maybe something we can do. But in these three years since that first initial recording, I mean, we've got such a more vast and experienced story to tell. So I'll take it as a plus. Yeah, thanks. And I think it's exciting to, you know, to be able to talk a little bit more about what we actually do as opposed to, I think at the time, it was what we were planning to. Or yeah, it's to concepts, and, yeah. Um, so it's kind of nice to have the, the app and the platform up and running you know, in the flesh, as it were. Um, and this is a audio medium for most. Some people would watch us on YouTube. Hello, if you are. We're talking about disability here. Have you got something to do with disability? Uh, what, what, what's your connection with disability? Uh, yeah, so I'm a wheelchair user. So I had a spinal cord injury uh, playing footy at school when I was 15. Uh, and I've used a, a wheelchair since. And so, um, uh, trying to think of how old I am now, but yeah, a good, a good 17 years. Yeah. So, oh my God, we're getting old. I remember <laughs> when you had your accident. Holy, <laughs> that made me feel old all yeah. of a sudden. Mm. 15 years. So what year at school were you when you had your accident? Uh, I was in year 11. Year 11, correct. Yeah. Did you repeat year 11 or did you? No, I mean, I, uh, I took a good six months off. Yeah. Just to sort of spend a little bit of time uh, in hospital and rehab. Uh, and then I started year 12. You did. After. And then you went into year 12 after missing year 11 and now you're in a wheelchair. And what just, if you can remember off the top of your head, what score did you get for your high school certificate? It's out of 99.95 .95 is the maximum. What, yeah. what score did you get? Uh, well, I, I can't. Well, I mean, I got a, I did all right. Matt got 99.95 after missing year 11. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty Straight into year 12. 99.95. You got 100% mate, didn't even go to school. Can you do, <laughs> this is else. a generic question, can you do anything? Yeah. You, could you, you have elected well, to become a vet? Could no, you have elected to become a yeah, doctor, Yeah, no, but the doctor, you got to do that, UMAT, it's called UMAT, yeah. where they do that personality oh. test. Okay, so you did have, yeah. essentially, because you would have passed that. Yeah. The choice of anything yeah, in front of you. Yeah, pick of the range, mate, you got 100%. Okay. Everyone wants the cute guy in a wheelchair, got 100%, Jesus, <laughs> including bloody Oxford who gave him a scholarship. And the reason that this is, and you get embarrassed, but I can do it for you. The reason this is so impressive to me is your life changes so much when you have disability, correct? Like that was probably yeah. the hard, you were probably finding the schoolwork easy, but you were probably finding the disability stuff hard. Is that, is, where, where did you fit on that? Yeah. I mean, I think that's actually right. Like I think in some sense, the school was like an outlet to be able to, that was something I knew how to do you know, yeah. for, for, for all intents and purposes. Uh, and so, yeah, I think definitely for me, like that was a familiar thing. Whereas the rest of the day was spending my time kind of adjusting to, um, I think not just like life using a wheelchair, but also I think a lot of the kind of the the change in perception and the change in the way how people were treating me mm. as to, you know, six months earlier. And what was that? Uh, people's expectations very quickly drop. Like you turn up in a wheelchair and there's a very different estimation of who you are, you know, what you're capable of, you know, whether or not people even talk to you kind of directly. And I think particularly when you're at school and, you know, you're 15, 16, 17, a time when you're more broadly like thinking about your identity and who you are and, you know, um, trying to really become, well, like trying to become the adult that you will be, uh, that was definitely like a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a rock in the boat as to all of a sudden all the things that I was used to in terms of how people treated me, how I could move through the world uh, were gone and were in place not just by different things but like far more negative mm. um, perceptions. It's a great way to put it. If you don't mind talking about um, your your background then, I know growing up in Melbourne, Victoria, but your mum's Thai? Yeah, so my mum's Thai and my dad's Italian, so I grew up in... Oh, what a sexy mix. mix. No wonder you're such mm -hmm. a hottie. Mm -hmm. well, I, yeah. I have good food at home. Which is <laughs> oh, yeah. Great food. God, I'd be, I'd be fat as a house if I had Italian oh, Thai every day. I'd be happy, though. <laughs> God, you'd be God, happy. I'd be massive. <laughs> but... Going, you know, did you ever visit where your, you know, did your mum grow up in Thailand? Yeah, so she grew up in Thailand and then moved here to study. Um, and so, yeah, we'd definitely go back to Thailand growing up yeah. for a month or two here and there to spend time with family. Did you go back there once you are in a wheelchair? Because it's pretty tough. Probably not for a couple of years afterwards. But yeah, 100%. And like, I think, you know, it's a combination of both infrastructure is different there, yeah. um, but two cultural attitudes. And I think, you know, as much as I love going to Thailand, there's definitely still much more prejudice and stigma around disability, you know, a lot of disabled people there are not afforded the same opportunity to go out and, you know, be in society and participate. A very lovely way to say a lot of them locked inside because bad for tourism vibes. <laughs> yeah. Like, and, and, and that's, and, and that's not just exclusive. That's in the stories we've heard. Yeah. Southeast Asia, that's in many places, mm -hmm. like even Eastern Japan, all kinds of places, you know? So. Yeah. 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 And a lot of this kind of, you know, like the cultural um, stigma around disability. Yeah. Bad uh, for family, bad is look. Really, yeah. is really, um, 
determinative. Like that is the kind of main thing that decides, which is unfortunate. Is there a spirituality difference as well that, you know, disability is looked through, you know, non-Christianity or just atheism or something like that, that a specific religion, and I'm not necessarily speaking about Asia, but maybe some of the stuff you know that, you know, maybe some uh, religion or religious beliefs dictate that people with disability are, you know, worse than a problem, um, you know, something like that? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but I think definitely, you know, part of the cultural stuff comes from the religion in the in the relevant area. Mm. And I think there's a lot of, you know, even in Western countries, there's yeah, a lot Catholic of this idea that Christian, you, same stuff. You deserve, you know, you've deserved it, basically, oh, or you, some you sort family, of punishment. Your parents are saying wrong. That's why you're like, yeah, uh, exactly. I used to get that as a kid. So yeah. it's, yeah, that's why religions are each their own, but it's a bit whack for disabled people because we're always the worst case or a punishment or yeah. I'll pray for you so you aren't as, this bad or whatever it is. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, the kind of very dominant narrative narrative around pity and charity and that mm. sort of stuff does stem from like a lot of this religious... Covering some areas cases. already mm. with Matt's <laughs> yeah. history. Second time around, the first it's one was more, us going, wheelchair, wheelchair, hello. Say, we're Look at us now, we're going to play religion. Yeah. yeah. Deep. You know, part of the, the reason that I work in the space that I do is, you know, exactly like you said before, Dylan, like it's not it's not fair that lots of people don't have the same opportunities or access mm. to different things purely by virtue of where they were born, when they were born, which are not things that they or anyone has any control of. Yeah. You weren't always this person who was comfortable not only with your disability but also wanted to help other people with disability. When did that shift happen for you? Was it a one moment where you realised that or was it a build-up over time where you wanted to give your career into over supporting people like us? Yeah, um, it definitely was a journey and I think, you know, probably one I'm still on. I think at the start in terms of like my own personal position around disability, it was very much, you know, and I play a lot of sport before I got injured and then I got injured playing sport. And I think for me it was very much like, oh, I've got an injury. I've just got to go and like rehab and recover from it and I'll back to, back to normal sort of thing. So I think definitely for a few years post-injury, it was, that was the, kind of dominant driver and I was probably pretty hesitant to be associated with the word disability. Yeah, you were. And yeah. did you, I, I can't remember the correct name, but did you, did you go to America and go to, I call it walking yeah. school. What, yeah. but what's it called? Where yeah. you relearn how to walk? Is that what it is? Yeah. It was um, called Project Walk. Yeah, yeah. And I, and you told me you're going, and I was like, oh, like just go on a bender in Europe, same price, but it's more <laughs> fun. But you know what I mean? But like, but it's true. It's, it's the journey you go on to realize. Yeah. Yeah. And I am glad I like went on the journey because yeah. I think it's an important thing to, you know, you have to kind of, you can get told lots of stuff. But, but it's great advice for people it. listening who might be in the same situation, like, you know, yeah. who get told don't do that or do this or whatever. Yeah. hundred percent. And I think for me, like going to the U S and so, you know, it was essentially this kind of activity based rehab, which now is actually much more mainstream, but at the time was pretty, um, specialist. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, so wouldn't, I call be, wouldn't have been funded by the NDIS. That's so why I call it walking school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I think what what was nice there is like it was the inverse of this expectation flow, yeah. right? It was this, they were like, well, let's have a crack. You know, I it. think in Australia, in the rehab and the, you know, the kind of public health system, there was very much this, like I remember, <laughs> I remember I had a meeting with my spinal consultant and he literally drew a graph on the whiteboard and he said, you know, this is Matt's function and, you know, kind of activity, and this is his um, this time. And he was here, he had an injury, dropped, you know, and uh, he'll just stay there forever. He'll just stay, then you're drawing a flat line right yeah. now. Yeah, and, you know, it wasn't just like a kind of medical diagnosis. This was like, and he's not going to be able, you know, like they told me, you'll have to repeat school, you might not be able to go back, you'll have to do, you know, a whole bunch of this yeah, stuff, right? That, so like, you can't do Bloody annoying, things. I hate mm. that. Yeah, and so the reality is, and I think this is the kind of thing that, you know, really annoyed me at the time was a lot of this becomes self-fulfilling. If you tell a person that they'll never do anything and then they just they just sit there expecting to never do anything and never try and do anything, they won't do anything. Of course. And then that becomes the kind of statistic you use to justify the next person you tell. Mm. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think in the US and particularly at these sort of facilities, it was a different mindset. It was like, well, we're not sure, but we may as well try. Let's have a crack. I don't mind that. Yeah. yeah. And I think that was the kind of main thing I took away, that here was this place where like, if they didn't know, instead of saying no, they just said they didn't know. But also, too, they were very happy to see what could happen. And like I said before, like I'm technically a quadriplegic, but I can, you know, move my hands and move around. And I'm, you know, really fortunate that a lot of the function that I have now, I didn't have when I first was injured and it's come back. Mm. And, you know, and that a lot might of that have been is, from the work that you put in, you know, for well, sure. a lot of that but is just the idea that like I was moving other parts of my body that I was told there's no point trying to. There's no point, you know, mm. trying to transfer or move around or trying to hold a pen, right? Like mm. I was told, just use a slint. Oh. And so I think that's the stuff that I took away. I think definitely over time, 
I've come away from the idea that like walking is the main thing I need to do. Um, and much more comfortable. Just want to add to that. I don't think I've touched a pen in five months. <laughs> Side note. Oh, just in general? Just in general. Just been living your I life? Just, you know, said hold a pen. I was like, I'm just trying to think when I last held a pen. Oh, all the signatures you signed on the street, Oh, mate. yeah, true. Actually, actually a couple oh, of hours ago. Yeah, sharpies, though. Yeah, yeah, only sh- yeah, mate, they're sharpies, brother. From that score, you did have the choice of doing anything. Um, and you got a doctor degree in law at, in Melbourne. It's a post-grad, post-grad. law degree. Yeah, but post-grad, post-grad law yeah. degree. Called a juris doctor. Uh, and then you headed to London and studied at the University of Oxford where you got a Master of Science in Social Science of the Internet. Yep. Is that right? Yeah. So I was fortunate to go to Oxford uh, on a Master scholarship. Master of Social Science of the Internet. Yeah. So I did I did two master's degrees in Oxford. Uh, one was a Master of Public Policy. Yeah, I knew that one. And then the other was, um, yeah, a, essentially a Master's in Social Science looking at um, looking at basically how the internet affects society. So particularly looking at the regulation of uh, what we now call artificial intelligence. AI, yeah. Oh, cool. Especially uh, for people with disability. So I think we briefly talked about this before and you're smarter than me, so correct me. But AI has the same bias as everybody else from generations before because it uses the information of mm. the internet from generations before, which, as we know, is very bad for minority groups, mm-hmm. especially disability. We have that problem with our jobs platform in the field where we've tried to change that because if you apply for a job, most people, most applications don't go to the recruiters. It's all done on AI. If you say you're disabled, AI goes, oh, they yeah. can't do that, and then you're out, correct? Yeah, 100%. And I think, you know, a huge part of my interest in this space was exactly this sort of stuff where, and you know, like an AI is a marketing thing, right? Like uh, it's good branding. It makes yeah. it sound, you know, far more cool mm. than, than it could be. Um, but for a lot of it, it's really pattern recognition. And it's using a lot of statistical stuff that has been around for a long time. And exactly this, in some places, you don't really want to identify patterns because the patterns that exist uh, are biased and not for good reasons. And so, you know, exactly that, the term they normally use is garbage in, garbage out. If you put in bad quality data, you'll get bad quality results. The problem is that if you have a human making the decision, those decisions, you can sort of critique them and say, you know, how did you do it? Is there bias? What's your reasons? If you punch it into a machine that doesn't spit out any reasons, just gives you an answer, it's both often seen as more objective. So they say, oh, the machine said it. And then two, you often can't scrutinize what's actually happening in, in play. So it's really problematic for lots can of we, reasons. Can we clip that and put that in my brain hmm. so I can say that exact answer when That's I'm on stage? Because that is exactly what it is. Yeah. That is so good. I think the danger with a lot of this stuff is that um, as I said before, like it's pattern recognition. And mm. if you're looking at the wrong patterns or repeating them, but not really critiquing them, uh, then it entrenches a lot of the problems that we have today. But then too, I think, you know, the tech industry is not the world's most diverse place. Mm. And I think if you have these decisions and these systems being created by people who, again, you know, a, a kind of very small subset of humanity, then they're not issues that they think about. And they design a lot of the tools that then a huge sub, you know, the majority of humanity uses. And that's a real problem. So I think part of this challenge is that's also how do you get more disabled people in these spaces? In those rooms to influence those people. 100%. Yeah. And actually, like, one of the things which I often get a little bit frustrated about is, like, a, a huge amount of tech innovation specifically, but innovation more broadly, is actually, has been actually driven by disabled use cases. A lot of things were invented for disabled people. And when they become really mainstream and widespread, the disability use case gets written out of it. They just become innovations. Text but things me- like- Text messaging. Yeah, text messaging, like emails, the telephone, like, you know, touchscreens, a whole bunch of stuff that was invented for disabled people, partly because, you know, you have to be creative and mm-hmm. think outside the box. Uh, and we don't sort of, associate disability with innovation the way we should. Yeah. Claimed by you, able-bodied wankers. Um, <laughs> Dylan's looking at me. I'm Thank looking at you, you, Angus. Hey, Appreciate that. Oh, when I think of Oxford University, I think prestige, smarts, but also old as, mm. couldn't have been the most successful place for you to go to uni, I imagine. Is this where the idea for the app stemmed from? Accessible? Not ac- non-accessible, yeah. yeah. Because I, I imagine it would be a tough place to get around. A thousand years old. Yeah, when I got the scholarship, then everyone was like, oh, uh, you know, how are you going to go in Oxford? A lot of cobblestones. And ironically, actually not that many cobblestones in Oxford. Ooh, I hate uh, cobblestones. It's the worst yeah. thing I've ever invented, cobblestones. Mm. I, I like stairs more than I have cobblestones because mm. at least with stairs I've got no chance. Cobblestones <laughs> I think I've got a chance and then I fall yeah. out and I go, ah, oh, that's annoying. Yeah. But it is funny because well, I would think, yeah, cobblestones. I yeah. can understand that. If someone said to me, described it, I would go, you oh, yeah, pro- cobblestones make sense. You've been to Lisbon in your wheelchair, Prague? Don't I go have, there. Yeah. Oh, mate, I left. You a lot of hills. Yeah. Yeah, well, not a lot of cobblestones, a lot of stairs. Um, and actually, yeah, so the the kind of first challenge I had was that um, in Oxford, you have to live in a college. And so, again, to your point, like thousand year old buildings. And so I contacted the university and said, out of interest, you know, which colleges have 
you know, better or worse wheelchair access, just so I can kind of sh- shortlist them. And the uh, unhelpful reply I got was, um, you know, thanks for your email. Unfortunately, we don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of the colleges. If you'd like, you can get in touch with them. Is that what they said? Wow. <laughs> Holy yeah. crap. That's loose. That is wild. So, yeah. um, so yeah. As I if thought, you were the first person as also, a chair that's like user the biggest, who emailed like, them. get effed ever. Like, yeah. oh, cheers, yeah. Ledge. Thanks for your help. Yeah, and this is exactly right. So, I thought, you know, I was like, oh, okay, great. Good to know Oxford has the internet. And basically, I went through, <laughs> like, and, and I... Individually, you know, I emailed 38 different colleges, 38 colleges in Oxford, to ask about, you know, whether they had wheelchair access to bedrooms and bathrooms and then the dining rooms and libraries yeah. and, and, you know, common rooms. And that was the thing. If they did know, they only knew for the bedrooms and bathrooms. There was sort of this presumption that, like, as a disabled student, I like, wouldn't do anything else. I'd yeah. just, like, yeah. sit inside for Go three to years. Like, common like, room? Yeah. You? Yeah, yeah. They're like, oh, you can't, you know, do any of the social stuff, which ironically is the whole reason the college system exists. But they were, you know, like, just very... They were like, but sort of confused as to why I would want to do those things. And so, actually, like when I arrived in Oxford, I thought this is absurd that in 2016, this is how, you know, disabled students have to figure this process out. Because I actually then stumbled into a college, like despite the research, I, f- I found I found a college because I, uh, I liked the picture it had on the internet of its quad. You know? Same as everyone else by the end of it. Yeah. You do your research. Like, oh, that looks cute. I'll go that one. Yeah, yeah honestly. Perfect. And you know, I was lucky that they had a wheel, an electric wheelchair user there who'd been there for seven years and during that time had made a bunch of changes. But long story short is I set up a student project to basically crowdsource this information from students in the colleges and we published that online. And over time, that just became more and more popular and we just started to get more and more requests for people to, you know, whether we knew information about the accessibility of restaurants and cafes and pubs and places people wanted to go with their friends and family. And so sociability kind of grew out of this organic need for this information in a high level of detail and also for places people wanted to go to have fun. It was this idea that, like, actually, you know, disabled people want to do the fun things too. Mm. Yeah, just, don't just go to hospital and I go wouldn't to mind playing beer yeah. pong. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I like botanical gardens, but like not every day. You know. Yeah, right. Like, literally, it's like that. If you wrote, yeah. if you search accessible tourism, Paris, it's like garden, garden, one gallery done. Yeah. It's yeah. like what about everything else? Um, is it a peer to peer kind of system where people with disability go, or do you hire the people to review it? We're talking about sociability now. Sociability, the app, yeah. yeah because I'm, one area I imagine is what is accessible for you isn't for me. Yeah. So, how do you figure that out throughout the app? So, sociability is geared around this idea that, you know, the information we provide is designed to be as objective as possible. So, we don't use labels like accessible or inaccessible. We don't use ratings. It's not a three out of five stars because, and part of this is because when I was in, the UK. I was trying to find a platform I could use. I was trying to, f- I wasn't, this is sort of my point before, I didn't set out to start something. I was just trying to find a thing to solve my own problem. And I kept coming across these platforms and they'd be like, yeah, it's three out of five. Like TripAdvisor like, or whatever it is. And I'd be like, yeah. what is, uh, what what is does three mean? out of five means? And yeah. to this point, right, like three out of five for me as a manual wheelchair user is one different to something to someone who's an electric wheelchair user. Who's a zero out of five, mm-hmm. yeah. But also for somebody who's blind or deaf or autistic. And so sociability is very much geared around like how can we make the information as objective as possible to give people the answers to the questions they need. So it's things like there's two steps at the front, the door's this wide, you know, the button oh, has so a it's rail. Like direct. So then you can make yeah. your own call if it's accessible for you or not. Yeah. And then through the technology, you can build a profile. So you can say, you know, I'm Dylan. I want a place that's got a step-free entrance, a bathroom with a grab rail and a doorway that's this wide. And then when you search and filter, it just shows you places that suit you. It's good. So are you, how many countries are you in? We're just in the UK at the moment. Uh, I've heard mm-hmm. of the UK. Yeah. It's a long um, way from where we are currently in Australia, but I have heard it's a good spot. Yeah. What's the plans? Uh, so at the moment, we're basically trying to use London as our kind of case study. So That's a massive city and very, I know you don't like this because we're objective, very non-accessible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. For the yeah. most part? Well, just think, in general. This is old. Yeah. It's getting better. It's definitely getting better. And yeah. part of the challenge, I think, in the UK in terms of the buildings is they won't build at the same time. So you have a building that the front bit might be from the 1900s, the back bit's from the 1800s, the yeah. side bit's from the 1700s, and the, the other, f- other bit's from the 2010s. And the and other so, room's like built two years ago. And you're like, oh, this looks new. But yeah. then the rest is like about to fall down. Right. Yeah. Same as train stations and all yeah. that. Yeah. So that's why the information needs to be really detailed because then you can search and filter and we can let the tech do the kind of heavy lifting to find the places that work for you. Um, but across London now, we have about 10,000 venues mapped. So if you use sociability in London today, you can pretty reliably find a cafe, a restaurant, a bar, you know, a place that you want to go with friends and family. That'll suit your needs. And, you know. and who's mapping it? So it's a mixture. We have a team of people. They go to the places, we call them our mappers, and they talk to the business owners. They explain the importance of you know, disability inclusion, and then they add that data into the platform. And that's how we know that it's accurate and it's up to date. So it's not always positive. So some of the reviews you might have in a cafe is like, hey, this isn't suitable for wheelchair users. Or do you mention that or you just only focus on the positive of, 
you know, Dylan's profile says he's a chair user, so you won't put that cafe on the map. No, so we put we put everything on the map, and the idea is that we don't actually have a positive or negative. No, slant. yeah, I was going to say it's not it a just, review; it's just info. It just says yeah. this yeah. only has. That's how you get away from it. Yep. Yeah. yeah, okay, exactly. And because a lot of people are really afraid, they're really yeah. like they don't want to. That oh, we don't have these. A bad Google rating, a bad rating, bad rating. Yeah, yeah. You can't, yeah. Yeah. Don't Google review. I noticed when you said review, my brain went, oh, "I wouldn't be a review; it'd just be information." Because yeah. what mm. works for our friend Ben, who's blind, is different to me. So you just say the info, and then we choose kind of thing. Yeah, hundred percent. And because actually, for the most part, people do just index on steps and ramps. And, you know, I'm a wheelchair user, so if I'm there, particularly so. And that's the whole point. They might be like, oh, we, we don't have a ramp. But actually, for a person who's deaf, they don't care, don't care about mm -hmm. a ramp. And so part of the challenge there is breaking that stereotype down. It's a great way to frame it. You're like, yeah, you might lose me as a customer, but you might gain heaps more, you know? So they might want to do it, yeah. Yeah, look, and part of it is to be pragmatic. It's to be able to say, you know, one, realistically, tomorrow... The, you know, not every building is going to be redesigned or remodeled, et cetera. So the most practical thing we can do in a world that, you know, wasn't built with accessibility in mind is give people the information to equip them to be able to choose where mm. they want to go and also to plan around obstacles. You know, disabled people are very used to having to work around stuff, but if you don't have the capacity to plan, it's a lot harder. And the second thing is also to start to say, well, look, if we can at least get more disabled people to come into spaces, that will spur the drive for them to improve the, the, the facilities. One of the most common things we hear is like, oh, we don't have accessible facilities or, you know, we don't have a wheelchair facility because we don't have dis wheelchair users who come. And you think, well, it's, this is the chicken and egg, right? Like, yeah. unless I went past every restaurant that I couldn't get into and somehow shouted off the street that I would have come in here <laughs> unless that, you know, except for there's excuse no Excuse me, ramp. excuse yeah. me, I would love to come in. Yeah, exactly, they would yeah. never see of it. Of course. How, did, how does the process work? Does it have to be somebody with lived experience putting in that advice? Otherwise, you know, you know I'm sure a business wouldn't say that they're, you know, I said they would. I went to so many houses that said they're accessible trying to rent. And I get there's, oh, by the way, the, the bathroom's up four stairs. I was like, what, why am I here? Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm. And okay. that was because they were trying their best, but they, they didn't know the data to put in. Yeah. So, and that's partly why we moved to this model where um, we put in the bulk of the data mm -hmm. and then we allow users to add information as well. But it's essentially, like you said, you know, it's kind of categorized as added by the crowd. And then eventually what we'll allow people to be able to do is like set up their own profiles as businesses. But we just are still working on the process of how to make sure that that information is as accurate and as trusted as possible. Because 100%, as a disabled person, you very readily go to a place where you've been told by that person it's accessible, you know, whatever that means. And then mm -hmm. you turn up and it's not. And so we're, you know, the goal is to really build a tool for the community that the community can use, but also that tr they trust. And I think to that extent, a really important part is making sure we have the data as accurate as possible. And I think a good example of this was, Dylan, you might remember at our old radio station, we went for a coffee around the corner in South Melbourne and uh, we walked up to this cafe and there was two steps or a step and I grabbed your arm and we got into that coffee place. And then um, the guy said uh, at some point, Oh mate, you know, you know, could you leave us a review? Didn't know who you were. Do you remember that guy? Yeah, he said, like, "Can you leave us a review about you know being a chair user?" And Dill went, "Well, it's not going to be good because there's a couple of stairs." He goes, "Oh, we've, we're accessible. We've got an accessible toilet." Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, "That guy." I always remember that guy would definitely be putting down his business as accessible because he was like, yeah. "I'm looking. Hey, please send yeah. send me to Google, which is important for a business." Yeah. Because he had a toilet yeah. and he didn't understand the scope of yeah. the, the small door. Do you get philanthropic equity or do the brands pay to be on there? Like how do people get involved? Yeah, so we're a for-profit company yeah. and part of that is also, well, actually the main driver of that is philosophical. Yeah. When I first started, like I said, it came from this student project. Initially, you know, people were very much like, oh, you're this This is a great idea. That's a great charity. Charity, yeah, yeah. And I was, you know, I got nothing against charity. Like, you know, I run a charity with my friends, which Dylan is very kindly a supporter of. Uh, but I think the problem is that a lot of the time there's no actual logic to it. It's just the concept of disability is it's associated with equals, charity. Equals free. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And and I and I found that really frustrating. Not least of all because in this space, right, like we're getting disabled people into spaces, cafes, restaurants, bars. You go and you spend your money there. And when I go to a restaurant, uh, you know, I'm not I'm not like Dylan. I, I have to pay. I have to pay. Right. And, like, <laughs> and to that extent, <laughs> true. It's you know he complains. <laughs> hey, true. True. Um, and it's real money, right? And like that restaurant gets custom from a disabled person. Now, if I'm with 10 friends and I can't get into a space, all 10 of us will go elsewhere, right? I don't just sit outside while my friends go and eat inside. So that's 10 people who are coming to a restaurant because of me, because of my accessibility needs. It's very much like dietary requirement information, right? And to that extent, that business gains something. And that's something I, you know, we think that they should pay for in the same way they pay for marketing to get non-disabled people to spaces. Mm -hmm. And we want this to be also something that it was not just a nice to have, you know, charity is good when you've got extra time and money, but it was something that, they needed to have for good business. And mm. I think to that extent, to answer your question, um, 
we do work for enterprises. So, you know, for example, we do lots of work for large corporates. Yep. They invite us out to kind of build accessibility guides to their premises or to their spaces or, you know, if it's a public space like a train station or a leisure centre or whatever it might be. Um, and more broadly, however, the plan is to be the leading data platform for accessibility information and to license that data into other platforms to unlock them for disabled people. Okay. And a very simple example is like very hard for me to use something like OpenTable or um, Booking.com, yeah. you know, I'm not going to put a deposit to book a restaurant if I don't know if I can get inside or use the toilet or whatever it is. They don't have this data. We can provide it to them in a way that's trusted but also takes the problem off their plate. And then all of a sudden, those platforms work better for everybody Because they'll say it on their own individual platforms. Very oh, that smart. sounds good, mate. I just got a little sh shivered in my spine. That makes so much sense. And, and also, the, the one thing about the, the philosophical... You know, the mappers that are out there for you, they're disabled. They deserve to get paid too, right? Mm. And often we're like, yeah, these people can come at me, but I'm not paying for it. It's like, well, why not? Like, yep. they're, they're doing a service mm. for you, yep. right? And that's going to bring, you know, not just social equity, but economic profits within mm. an organisation. Mm. So, yeah. Bowl of Uncomfortable time. Do you remember the Bowl of Uncomfortable as a segment? I do. Do you remember what we asked you last time? No. I cannot remember. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it mustn't I, have been uncomfortable that's enough. How I can't remember because we didn't record it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but the Bowl of Uncomfortable, for those who are new uh, listening, maybe some of uh, Matt's Oxford friends, get at. Um, this is a segment where we uh, get questions from the listeners, or maybe it's the question Dylan or myself think is more risky or a bit more personal than what we've got so far. The reason about it is called the Ball of Uncomfortable. This whole podcast is about making the uncomfortable comfortable. Hopefully, by answering that question, if you're comfortable doing so, yeah. um, we can break down some more barriers. Here we go, Dil. Amy definitely knows you or went to school with you, I reckon, because this is a weird one. Amy. Uh, on Facebook. Being at a private school at the time of your accident, do you feel like <laughs> your school marketed from your accident and the recovery to promote the school as inclusive for their benefit? Uh, what an interesting question. question. That, yeah. that reeks of, I was there. I was about to say, I mean, to be honest, I'm not sure. Like in the sense of, and I think at this point, kind of what I mentioned before, I was sort of preoccupied with a bunch of things. Yeah. Um, I but, mean, for what it's worth, my school definitely did a lot of things to make it more accessible to me as a wheelchair user at the time. I won't name the school, but it is easily one of the least accessible schools I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Because I looked at it when I was going to go there. So I couldn't oh. even imagine how you were going to go there. My yeah. grandpa went there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, 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 no secret. I went to Scotch. Oh, cool. Sure oh, you yeah. There it is. You can, uh, Delete, yeah. So yeah. Scotch got so many F and stairs. Mm. Go on. Yeah. yeah. It's an old um, school building though, once again. Yeah. We'll, we'll, like I said, some of them. You know, I think they did a lot to, to help in terms of making it more accessible to me at the time. Uh, as to whether they marketed it or not, I'm not sure. Um, I think definitely though, it was, at least from my kind of understanding, the first time they probably reckoned with accessibility in terms of in their whole life, yeah. And I think, you know, I'm, I hope that it's left a bit of a legacy where they have to now, you know, it's not going to be this thing where, oh, yeah, if they can, we could make the changes. They've, they've been made. Uh, and I also should point out, uh, my grandpa went to Wesley College, not Scotch. I don't know why I got involved Violet in that. Violet Crumbles. <laughs> Apologies. Is that what we call people from Wesley? Violet Crumbles. Is it? Yeah, because they dress in... Oh, I love yeah, Wesley, purple, actually. The purple, the purple. God, this is the most private... Can we delete this out? I think, fuck off. This is the <laughs> most private, private school, school, school chat boys. ever. Okay. It sucks. I have my accident playing against Wesley. Oh, oh boo! The Violet Crumbles. How dare you, Wesley? Oh, Learn how to tackle. Learn how to tackle, right? <laughs> oh. um, Bowl of Uncomfortable here from Wade in Broken Hill. Shout outs to Wade in Broken Hill. A couple of hours. Just the most in between place, not ever, but in between <laughs> Victoria and South is Australia. It, is it hilly? Very remote. Is it hilly? There's a couple of broken ones. Uh, if you could, this, I love this question by Wade as well. That's, that's tough. That's, <laughs> that's tough gag. Right. I think this is a fantastic question as far as a ball of uncomfortable. I'm jealous I didn't come up with it. Okay. And I think you're going to have a great answer. And hopefully it's quite an intriguing question for you to think about. And for people who are in the same situation. Couldn't be better than Amy's. <laughs> <laughs> Amy's was good. If you could have delayed, not stopped your injury by 10 years, meaning you would delay your injury till recently, you know, within the last five Great or seven. Great question. Would you delay it? I've never been asked that. That's a ripper. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm Wade. Uh, so instead of being 17, you're 27. So you'd still be in a chair I'm today. Trying to think. I'm going to answer that too. I'm, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I think there's probably two ways to think about it. I mean, the short answer is probably. Uh, Why? Yeah. So I think this, again, like I would say two things. Like one is as a 27 year old, I think you are more comfortable with who you are. And I, and I, I definitely grew up a lot during that period, but I, I think in hindsight, I definitely grew up, I had to grow up faster, you know? Yeah. And I think to that extent you get a, you know, you get a lot out of that process, but is it an easy process? Not particularly. And I think, you know, um, I could see a world in which uh, it would have been, 
nicer to have a kind of period where uh, I knew who I was when I had the injury. That said, I think the flip side of the kind of question is also 10 years later, um, like, you know, let's say I have my injury now. More to lose, baby. I uh, only got more to lose when you're 27 is how I think about it. What yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, like, I think also, though, like 10 years later in terms of time, like in 2023 or 2024, hmm. uh, things are much more progressed. And I, you know, I often think about this in the perspective of sociability. Like if I was trying to do what I'm doing now in the 50s, you know, no chance or yeah. even 20 years ago. Yeah. I think the awareness around disability perception and the kind of, you know, the accessibility movement more broadly is only increasing. And if I was, you know, going to become a wheelchair user, you know, there's probably no better time than now than, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. I think you and I'd be well dead if we're in the 50s, to be honest, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's not be blunt. I reckon I'll delay mine by 20 because 10. Okay, yeah, 10. Course. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably not. It's interesting though. It's a really, because like, oh, I could have. So you're saying you wouldn't take the 20 years of able-bodied life? Uh, yeah, but always the same question. But you would, don't know what it's like on the would, other side. Would you rather have this? what it's like to walk and feel the sand between your toes and then lose it or not? Mm. I'd probably, I like it I like it doing that way rather than would you rather be cured or not? It's like, you still got to have it. Yeah. Where would you want to have it? It's like, oh, that's actually a really good question. Yeah. Is it, so you could go, would you Definitely, get a lot yeah. of, go back and like, you know, not be rock, not rock up to that footy game that day. We get that question a lot, but yeah, I like the but idea. That one's of good. Like it's gonna happen anyway. But when did you want it to happen? Yeah, yeah. Did, cool. I did just get a text off Amelia saying we forgot to record this. Oh, oh. god! Yeah, sorry, just my heart just dropped. Oh, you see his face. He oh god! Um, oh. We're gonna put that question out to you as well. What on Wade? Um, thanks. Yeah, for, if, that, if that's a question that stokes this much interest in this room, maybe out there as well. So that I, question will be posted on our socials, or if you're watching this on YouTube, jump in the comments. Um, the question is for you as well. And while you're there, please subscribe. Yeah. Now, only three of us or four of us heard the last conversation, mm. including the person who recorded. I reckon oh, the second I think one. He's on his phone the most. <laughs> I reckon the second one was better. Thoughts, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I have been practicing since. That I was, was great. Yeah, so. I was, that was much better. I think it was. I think we were all better. Yeah. Actually, we knew what we were doing. You know what you're doing. Mm. Great job, Amelia. Needs to act. Mm. Amelia definitely knows what she's doing. She knows what she's doing. Uh, if you're in London, download the Sociability. Can you app. download the app from here? Or is it only in the UK App Store? No, I mean, so I mean, to your question before, the app actually works everywhere. Yeah. So you can download it and use wherever. But Check in it terms out. of um, the Actual data, mappers and it'll data. be much yeah. more useful in London. But if you're going to London on holidays, hundred percent, yeah. And mm-hmm. look, the plan is definitely to scale. You know, and we hope to be able to take what we're building in London to the rest of the world. I know a guy in mm-hmm. Australia's got some good contacts. If you need ambassador, yeah, true. Mm-hmm. And so, but, but it's great. What an amazing large user um, case to take to the larger tech world to get that funding Very to make cool, this mate. worldwide. Good on you, uh, Matt. Thanks, guys. Loved it. Have to be honest with you, that was fantastic. Let's not lose you to some money hungry job. You know, use that or, big brain know, of yours. Yeah, go go be money hungry and then spend, some, you know, come back and Sell be. Sell this a, for 100 mil, actually, and then you're money hungry. Yeah, philanthropist. Right? Good on you, brother. Very proud of you, mate. Well done. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me.